The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us today for our uh, webinar on the basics of bikeway selection at intersections and with parking. Um, so you know, many of you are involved in bicycle, um, bicycle and pedestrian projects uh, in various capacities, and you're often trying to determine you know, what is the appropriate bikeway for this particular corridor. Um, we are gonna dive into two topics, two factors today that are gonna really impact that decision and share some guidance with you uh, that you can use now uh, to help make those decisions. And so we'll talk about intersection factors uh, that impact bikeway selection as well as um, on-street parking. And, and parking issues. So we're glad that you're here to join this conversation with us today. I wanna to introduce you to our panel and our topic today, but first I just wanna cover a bit of housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our webinars, welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, you, uh, we're gonna be in listen-only mode for most of the time, but you do have the ability to submit questions to us and comments along the way. So if you look for the questions pod within the GoToWebinar control panel, that's where you can find um, an open box, text box, that you can just submit things to us along the way. We'll be monitoring that. We may be able to respond to your question along the way, um, but we really are interested in compiling uh, those questions for a discussion period that we have planned toward the end of the webinar. Uh, so send those questions at any time. And we'll save that end of the period uh, for, to, to answer those. Uh, we are archiving this webinar. We've already posted the webinar slides. Um, if you follow pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars and navigate to this session, you'll be able to find the slides posted there. I'll share the link in just a moment as well. Um, we are gonna record it. We are recording and we'll post that to our YouTube channel and share that um, video out with you probably within a day, um, maybe this afternoon. Uh, so we'll post that in case you know of someone who wanted to attend but couldn't, uh, that'll all be available. Um, we have, for those who are looking for it, a live trans transcript, excuse me, of today's webinar. Um, available. I'll push the link out to you um, uh, to that shortly. Uh, we'll have that available to those who need it. And um, we're going to be following up later today with certificates um, of completion, instructions for how to get those, um, professional development hours. We did get this webinar approved for 1.5 CM credits by uh, AICP. So if you claim those, you can navigate to their website and claim those credits as you usually do. The follow-up email is going to have all this information, a link to the recording, a link to the archive page, and some of this stuff about the uh, certificates of completion. So um, that'll all be coming to you later. Um, at this point, what I'd like to do is shift gears a bit, segue into our topic, and introduce you to the panelists who are joining us today. Uh, first, we're joined by Tamara Redman, who is the Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety Program Manager in FHWA's Office of Safety, where she has worked for 24 years. In her job, she develops programs and resources to help reduce pedestrian and bicyclist crashes, fatalities, and injuries. And in addition to the updated pedestrian and bicyclist safety RSA guidelines, which we covered in a recent webinar, other recent accomplishments include the completion of a searchable pedestrian and bicycle safety information tool, development of the guide for uh, scalable risk assessment methods for pedestrians and bicyclists, and completion of the bikeway selection guide, as well as the resources we'll be talking about today. So we're uh, grateful to have Chairman Redmond with us. Lauren Blackburn is also here. Uh, Lauren is a senior project manager with VHB. Um, Ms. Blackburn has over 17 years of experience in multimodal and long range planning, and she's based in VHB's Raleigh, North Carolina office. Uh, Ms. Blackburn's key areas of interest are in bicycle and pedestrian transportation, comprehensive planning, roadway safety, and community health. And prior to joining VHB, she worked for the North Carolina Department of Transportation as the director of the Division of Bicycle and Pedestrian Transportation. Previously, she was the planning manager for the town of Davidson, North Carolina. So we're grateful to have Lauren with us today as well. Um, Dan Goodman is here. He is the Mid-Atlantic Director of Planning at Tool Design. He has nearly 20 years of experience in multimodal transportation planning and design in the public and private sectors. He has a deep experience working on a broad range of active transportation project types for public agencies and private stakeholders throughout the U.S. Dan leads a team of uh, practitioners focused on planning and designing equitable, safe, and comfortable transportation networks that support community goals and meet the needs of people of all ages and abilities. So we're thankful that Dan is here with us today. Uh, we're finally joined by Jared Draper. Uh, Jared is Tool Design's Raleigh Office Director, Raleigh, North Carolina. He's a transportation planner with experience partnering with communities to develop context-specific multimodal solutions. His people-focused approach has resulted in the creation of safer mobility facilities specifically for more vulnerable users, such as pedestrians and bicyclists, that enable comfortable trips for people of all ages and abilities. Um, so this panel is really gonna provide a lot of their expertise and insight 
into uh, the tools, the, the topics we're addressing today, especially the tools that they've developed um, in this project with FHWA. But as a next step, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Tamara Redman um, to introduce us to some of the um, pedestrian and bicyclist safety work going on at FHWA. So Tamara, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Dan, and thanks everyone for joining us um, today. Um, I want to just talk about a few resources that the Federal Highway Administration and the Department of Transportation as a whole have available. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I want to just give a brief overview of the bikeway selection guide, um, the recently updated road safety audit guide and prompt list for pedestrians and bicyclists, um, our efforts in the pedestrian and bike safety focused states and cities, uh, the US DOT action plan um, for pedestrian safety and safe transportation for every pedestrian. Next slide, please. Um, the bikeway selection guide was published about two years ago in 2019 um, in order to support other technical design guidance, such as the um, forthcoming update to the ASTO guide for the development of bicycle facilities. And since the release of the guide um, two years ago, um, we have been, we have done 20 workshops to summarize the key points and to help practitioners apply it to their local projects. And we've also um, become aware that several state DOTs and local agencies have incorporated um, the bikeway selection guide into their local design manuals for roadways. So we're happy to know that this has been such a helpful resource. And today the team will discuss additional resources that were released earlier this year as a supplement to the bikeway selection guide. Uh, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned, the P pedestrian and bike road, road safety audit guide and prompt list was updated. Um, for those unfamiliar, RSA is a formal safety performance examination of an existing or a future road or intersection by an independent um, multidisciplinary team. And the process essentially tells about potential safety issues and helps identify improvements. And this specific guide is obviously focused on the pedestrian and bicyclist safety aspect of that. Um, and this was released last fall. Uh, next slide. And I also wanted to mention um, efforts that we've had ongoing um, for our pedestrian and bicycle safety focus states and cities. Um, our office has been providing extra resources to the cities and states with the highest pedestrian and bicyclist fatalities and or fatality rates for a number of years now, um, since about 2004. Um, and we don't provide funding for projects, but what we've been doing is working with the states and cities to help them develop action plans for increasing pedestrian and bicyclist safety. And we've also been offering free technical assistance and training on the design of safe facilities and on how to develop um, safety action plans. Um, as mentioned, um, this has been a program ongoing since 2004. So every five years or so, we look at those states and cities and reevaluate them. And a lot of them have stayed the same, but um, they often change. So we recently did another reevaluation um, and we'll be rolling out the new program, hopefully by this fall. Uh, next slide, please. And this, this map, I'll leave it here for a second. Um, shows what the current list of states and cities are that are eligible for this um, assistance. Next slide. So as part of that effort, um, we've done about 400 training courses and we've trained over 6,000 people. Um, beyond training, we also have provided crash data analysis and helped with the countermeasure helped with countermeasure selection for areas that have requested it. We've also done uh, many webinars and peer exchanges. In fact, this webinar today is sponsored by our Focus States and Cities program. Uh, we also have done action plan development and briefings to management to kind of 
um, impress upon them the importance of pedestrian and bike safety in projects uh, when we've been requested as well. Next slide. And last, um, last winter, we completed this um, USDOT Pedestrian Safety Action Plan. This was an effort that took place over the period of about a year. Um, in July last year, we had a virtual pedestrian safety summit where we collected quite a bit of input into um, the actions that we're going to be doing. So basically, this action plan tells what we the entire U.S. Department of Transportation, of which Federal Highway Administration is one agency, intends to accomplish with respect to pedestrian safety in the next two years. And we did take into account the themes identified by our stakeholders during those um, summit webinars, and that's incorporated in here as well. And there's a link there to you know, how you can find the document to view. Uh, next slide. And finally, I wanted to mention um, our safe transportation for every pedestrian program. Next slide. So STEP is essentially um, a, a marketing campaign, I guess, is the best way to explain it. It's sort of like our focus states and cities effort, but it's focused on promoting countermeasures to the states that are interested. So really getting them to take these and um, start implementing um, a program that involves them. And those countermeasures include um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Um, they're all mainly focused on you know, mid-block crossings, uh, leading pedestrian intervals, crosswalk visibility enhancements, raised crosswalks, pedestrian crossing and refuge islands, pedestrian hybrid beacons, and road diets. Next slide. Next slide, please. Thanks. So this program, I think, continues through um, the summer. But sort of like the focus states, um, there's been action plan development. Um, there have been um, workshops focused on the countermeasures to MPOs, state DOTs, and partners. There have been scan tours and road safety assessments, and also a variety of resources that have been developed that can is you can find at that link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide. So finally, that concludes my part of the presentation. And now um, Lauren Blackburn is going to talk um, about the resources that are part of the bikeway selection guide. Yeah, thank you, Tamara. Uh, so, as Tamara mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of interest in the bikeway selection guide. Uh, it was released a couple of years ago, and I think, you know, for anyone who has looked at it or participated in one of those workshops, you'll probably recognize these matrices that we have at the lower right-hand corner of this slide. So, you know, these matrices are really there to help uh, support the decision maker think through preferred bikeway types based on conditions like traffic volume and speed. And, you know, in each different setting, whether it's urban or rural, uh, these tools have been really effective and helpful for uh, getting decision makers to be able to better understand not only what the, the preferred options would look like, uh, and there's a lot of visualizations in the guide to, to certainly check out, but also to have a better understanding about how these form a network as a whole. Next slide. Uh, in the guide itself, there's also some really important decision-making processes that I don't want to overlook. Uh, the flowchart has been really instrumental to helping agencies understand that essential part where after you've selected that preferred bikeway type, that you, you spend some time assessing and refining and evaluating feasibility of the bikeway types. Every site has its own set of constraints and every location is going to present different challenges. So the, the bikeway selection guide also provides some helpful guidance on that and ultimately ties it back to some of the, the key principles for network design like you see at the top. Um, if you haven't had a chance to check out the selection guide, uh, certainly visit the link that's in the lower right-hand corner. If you go underneath the portion of that page 
uh, that is under uh, resources, you'll see the bikeway selection guide. And then I would also want to make sure that everybody's aware that there is also a literature review that was developed before and in support of the bikeway selection guide that compiles information from around the world, really, about how different agencies have been setting up their own bikeway selection resources, uh, where the data comes from, and some other helpful resources. So certainly check out those additional uh, resources when you're thinking about the bikeway selection guide. Next slide. So during those workshops that Tamara mentioned, we heard um, that practitioners were asking some good questions about trade-offs, but two particular topics kept on coming up. And that's really what led the team to develop these supplemental resources that we'll talk about today. Uh, a major question that kept on coming up is how to, to, to assess the trade-offs between uh, keeping or implementing on-street parking adjacent to or maybe um, taking away on street parking in favor of bikeways. You know, how have different agencies uh, considered those different trade-offs? How might you analyze some of those options? And how do you communicate some of the decisions? So that became a really important theme and something that the bikeway selection guide itself touched on, but uh, we recognized we could do more to provide more information about that. And then secondly, intersections. So intersections, of course, are a key location where bicyclists in particular are um, more vulnerable uh, to a crash. And this makes it very important from a safety perspective that we think about how bikeways themselves integrate uh, into and through intersections. So the, the supplemental resource again talks about how bikeway selection works with intersection design. But in both cases, each of these resources, just like the bikeway selection guide, none of them are design resources on their own. There are planning level tools that should be um, considered at the earlier stages and to feasibility and assessment, but certainly keep in mind that these won't be able to give you specific dimensions or data points that um, you should think about when you're in the more formal design process. That's where other resources, um, such as those uh, published by ASHTO and NACTO, can come in very handy to help you understand more of the detailed design elements. Next slide. So uh, that, that led us to pr produce these resources. We're looking forward to sharing that um, information, the high-level overview of each of the resources with you all today. Again, these can also be found on that same website where the Bikeway Selection Guide resource itself is published. And uh, we hope that these are helpful um, to helping you all understand you know, how to initially assess your intersections and your parking options when it comes to bikeways. But uh, I'll turn it over to Dan and Jared to tell us more. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Dan, and yep. the um, slides coming your way. Okay. And do the slides look okay on your end, Dan? Yeah, it looks great, Dan, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Lauren. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. Um, as, as Dan mentioned, I'm the Director of Planning for the Mid-Atlantic Region at Tool Design Group. Uh, and I'm joined today by Jared Draper, who is our Raleigh Office Director. Um, and we worked really closely with Lauren and her team at VHB and Tamara and her team at, at the Federal Highway Administration um, in developing the resources that, that we'll be discussing um, today. Um, so as background, um, as Lauren mentioned, the Bikeway Federal Highway Administration published the Bikeway Selection Guide in 2019. Since then, um, we've been involved um, with a lot of workshops across the U.S., um, really focusing on the Bikeway Selection Guide and, and working with agencies and communities to apply it to their local context. Um, and at the workshop, as, as at a lot of the workshops, as Lauren mentioned, there was kind of really two key things um, that came out, which is that intersections and parking are key, key considerations that, that a lot of agencies and, and communities struggle with. Um, so today, I'm going to describe the parking resource. Um, Jared is going to walk through the intersection resource. Um, and, and what we hope you'll see is that, that there's some consistent themes across the two resources, um, and also back to the original bikeway selection guide. 
um, which is that this is this is all about balancing geometric dimensional requirements, um, really getting into some really sticky, tough trade-off decisions, um, making choices that reflect community values, um, and really thinking about kind of agen agency priorities for the use of limited and constrained space. Um, so what we want to emphasize kind of in the documents and in this presentation is really that these resources are intended to inform dialogue that happens as part of the local transportation process, um, that robust public engagement is needed, um, that we need to recognize kind of equity at every step along the way, um, and that ultimately these are context sensitive decisions as, as Lauren mentioned. Um, so, so local context matters. Um, and with that in mind, we'd like to try something a little bit different, which is to use Mentimeter um, to ask you to provide a little bit of feedback to us. Um, we encourage you to go to menti.com, which is M-E-N-T-I.com, and enter this code, uh, which is 39979432. Um, first, we're going to do this two times. Um, the first one is, is we're going to ask you a question about parking in your community, parking and bikeway selection in your community. The second question we're going to ask you is about intersections and bikeway selection in your community. Um, so we encourage you to do this. You are also most welcome to enter information into the chat box, um, and we'll incorporate that into our discussion um, as we move forward. So um, you'll see the address and the code on the next slide, and here's the question we want to um, learn from you on, which is, in your community, what are the biggest challenges when you're attempting to balance on-street parking needs and goals for a connected bike network? Um, we're going to leave this slide up. You can um, enter information on menti.com um, at any point as I walk through the next 10 or so slides. Um, and then we're going to come back to this slide and you'll see kind of your responses populate as they come into this word cloud. And we'll spend a minute talking about each one. Um, so please, uh, you can use your phone. You can also open a new tab on your computer. Um, if, if that is easier, you can also enter information into the chat box. Um, but what are the biggest challenges about parking um, and bikeway selection? And again, you know, we've seeded a couple ideas in here. You're welcome to reiterate them if this reflects your community experience or add new, new information um, and reiterate what you see other people talking about. All right. So I'm going to start by talking about the parking resource. Um, this document, as I mentioned, is, is really about trade-offs. It's about priorities and values. Um, it's about selecting preferred alternatives um, through an equitable and inclusive planning process. This is context-sensitive solutions. Every site is going to be different, but, but we recognize and we've heard that this is one of the stickiest issues where more information is needed to inform the planning and design process and the ultimate decisions um, that come out of that process. So the document builds around kind of these two core building blocks, which are the, the type of parking. And just to be clear, we're talking about on-street parking in this situation as opposed to structured parking or surface parking. Um, but the first building block is the types of on-street parking. The second building block um, is the types of bikeways. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, um, we we didn't this we didn't go deep into the design. I think that's more appropriate in other places, um, such as the Astro Bike Guide or Federal Highway Resources. Um, but it does talk about some associated dimensional requirements because ultimately that's what's going to frame the, the trade-off considerations that we talk about in the local transportation planning process. Um, so, so I want to recognize at the outset that, that we're generally talking about reallocation of existing space and working within fixed and constrained environments. Um, so not always, but often um, it is a zero-sum game where we can either have A or B, uh, but not, mo not both. Um, 
so so the I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of these building blocks on the next few slides, but the parking types, we've identified three specific parking types for on-street parking, which is reverse angle in parking, parallel parking, and head in angled parking. And we, we talk about four different bikeway types. Um, to be clear, we don't consider a shared lane to be a, a bikeway, uh, but we do discuss that um, but but primarily focusing on bike lanes, one-way separated bike lanes, and two-way uh, separated bike lanes. So so ultimately, what we're talking about is competing interests and um, competing goals, frankly, such as safety and mobility. Um, you know, the I think there's a broad recognition throughout the resources that um, we're competing for space when we think about kind of what the cross section ends up looking like. So the parking in most cases is going to take something like 8 to 20 feet of lateral space in the cross section. The bikeways also, um, you know, acknowledging that comfort is often a function of the width allocated to that to that facility. So with more width, it provides for things like separation for motor vehicles, um, more space within the bike lane to maneuver, um, and also a better ability to appeal to less competent um, bicyclists, which is really important when we think about things like the impact of the number of customers we can be delivering to a local business. Last thing I'll say is that embedded in a lot of the things that we're talking about today is the idea of connected, comfortable, and safe uh, bicycle networks. And so we we recognize that you know all these facilities and all these decisions are ultimately getting us to hopefully the idea of a connected network. And so some, some links within that network are gonna be absolutely critical um, and other links, there may be a, a parallel route that is acceptable. Um, so that's something that, that folks are dealing with all day, every day, obviously. So the parking types, um, I've got the, a picture of each parking type up on the screen. Um, I'll, I'll just say a few things about each type. Um, the guide, the resource, actually um, provides a lot of information on dimensions, safety considerations, parking maneuver considerations, and also loading, unloading, and delivery um, considerations for each of these parking types. But but big picture, um, reverse angled in, um, you need around 17 feet minimum. The depth is going to depend on the angle of the parking uh, aisle. Um, it provides generally uh, very good sight distance. Um, it can reduce bicyclist dooring issues. Um, and there's good passenger channelization. So I'll say one thing I like about this parking type is that when, when I pull in and my kids jump out of the car, the door ends up pushing them towards the sidewalk rather than pushing, kind of allowing them to go into the street. Um, downsides, it's not as common of a movement. Um, and, and, you know, large trucks have, have difficulty accessing the curb, so they may end up loading and unloading um, in the travel lane or in the middle of the street. Um, parallel parking, that's something that, that you know, I know everybody um, is aware of and, and sees. Um, we're talking about seven feet minimum, kind of when you've got delivery trucks, probably closer to eight feet desirable. Um, the good thing, a helpful thing, is that in a context of constrained situations, it requires the least amount of street width. Um, passengers have good access to the sidewalk. It combines well um, with things like bus zones and loading zones and typical curb uses. Um, some downsides, the, the doors, you know, in contrast to reverse angled in, the doors open into the travel or the bike lane. The sight lines can be not as good um, there can be some interference in the bike lane. Um, and in practice, it's all it's often still difficult for trucks to access the curb space. The third type, uh, head in angled, um, talking about around 17 feet minimum. Um, it requires less maneuvering on the entry into the spot. Um, a good thing is that um, there's less there tends to be less overhang on the sidewalk. So the vehicle, when cars are pulling head in, they stop where they're supposed to when they're back back in angled. 
um, they can overhang into the sidewalk a bit more. Um, it does reduce sight distance for drivers backing out. Um, loading can happen in the street, often does in, in practice. Um, but then in contrast to the other one also, the, the passengers are channeled towards the street in this situation and, and large trucks um, still often cannot access the curb. So positives and negatives with each one. Uh, parts of the, the tools in the toolbox. Um, the resource does provide some design criteria, and so um, it provides some dimensions for back-end angled parking, for example. Um, I don't need to go, go into this in detail, other than to say that the depth is, is typically measured from the curb, um, not the actual stalls. So, so kind of considerations for parking. Um, and, you know, I think it's really important to be thinking as part of the planning process about physical and operational uh, benefits. Um, we often think about parking in a kind of one dimensional way, but it's important to recognize that it's, you know, parking is providing a buffer for pedestrians. Um, it's, it's providing access for people with disabilities. It can, it can be a separated bike lane buffer. It can help to reduce speeds and add add kind of friction in the street environment that ends up slowing people down. Um, and it can also provide space for curb bulbs and protected intersections and the like. Also scooter and bike parking. Um, it's flexible, so parking can be uh, repurposed, for example, to peak hour travel lanes. Um, accessibility is really kind of the key consideration when we're thinking about these things. Um, we know that the ADA prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities and the provision of a public entity services, programs, and activities. So the provision of on-street parking is a service provided by public entities. And so accordingly, um, a city must ensure that it provides some accessible on-street parking where it provides on-street parking. Um, and, and one thing I'd like to emphasize here is, is the importance of engaging people with disabilities in the planning process to understand the needs kind of in the local context. So there's a lot of options for reallocating space from on-street parking and the resource talks about a lot of those and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more detail on, on the next few slides about this. Um, but, but I also wanna emphasize that equity and inclusion is a critical part of every step of this process. And that, you know, that includes race, equity, social justice, and then, and, and it's not, you know, it's not just in kind of the fact of having a public meeting. Um, it's, it's from beginning to end. So it's talking about context setting and scopes and schedules and the vision and goals for a project, how we think about and evaluate existing conditions, alternatives, how we prioritize, um, and how we evaluate the process and the outcomes. It kind of needs to come in in every, every step along the way. So, so similarly, um, on the, the bikeway type. So that was kind of describing the parking type side of the story. Um, on the bikeway type side of the story, I, I mentioned that shared lanes are, are not considered a bikeway, typically 10 to 15 feet um, within a cross section. Um, and importantly, it's, it's not generally not an all ages and abilities type facility, um, unless it's something like a neighborhood greenway. Um, a bike lane, the width is going to depend on the placement. Um, so, you know, whether it's adjacent to a curb or the edge of the pavement, whether it's adjacent to parking and, and whether a door zone buffer is being provided. Um, for one way and two way separated bike lanes, I mean, uh, you know, the, the bikeway selection guide goes into detail about the different facility types, but a one way separated bike lane on both sides, um, going to provide better access. It's going to be a little bit more predictable movement, um, less concern about dooring. It's definitely all ages and abilities network, um, but it's going to take a little bit more space within a cross-section uh, than a two-way separated bike lane. So the two-way is, you know, there could be an access concern um, if, if, for example, there's a lot of destinations on both sides, but the facility is only on one side. Um, the movement can be less predictable. Um, but it is, it, it can still be an, an all ages and abilities uh, type network. So the guide talks about dimensions and considerations uh, for one way and two way separated bike lanes. The thing I'll point out is that it 
depends on bike volume and, and really the separated bike lane placement and design. So the um, another thing that I think is important to point out about the resource is that, um, you know, I, I said jokingly that it was a zero sum game, but but there is a lot of flexibility uh, for for strong planning decisions within a lot of these um, conversations um, and decision making processes. So so there's ways to enhance bicyclist and comfort and safety um, with all the potential options. So if you end up with conventional bike lanes, for example, there's the option of, of using colored pavement or uh, for one-way separated bike lanes, thinking about kind of the different design elements and how they, how they add up to create a safe, comfortable, and connected facility. So there are things you can do to enhance the experience for all the different uh, potential choices. The other thing I want to emphasize is that when we're reallocating space, uh, from on-street parking, it's not an all-or-nothing thing, and so we can think about things like intermittent reductions or converting the type from from parallel to reverse angled in, um, reallocating the capacity, talking about parking management strategies to better utilize the existing supply of parking, um, or to to do a hybrid where you do some combination of all those those options. Um, last thing I'll say is that in the guide, we do talk about um, assessment strategies. So we talk about three specific things um, in the guide. The first one is assessing trade-offs at the cross-section level. Um, so what we did was, was try to think about a typical cross-section and we, um, what, we, what we landed on was a, a two-lane road with a center, continuous center turn lane and parking on both sides with a really constrained right away width on purpose. And so we, we tried to think about kind of what would happen if, if we reallocated the center turn lane and put in traditional bike lanes and kept parking on both sides. What would happen if we kept parking on both sides, reduced the center turn lane and added a two-way separated bike lane? Um, and what would it look like if we had separated bike lane, one-way separated bike lanes on both sides reduced the center turn lane and lost one side of parking. In each of those scenarios, it's got different trade-off considerations. And so we uh, we dug into that a bit. Um, we also flagged some data-driven decisions and some questions to discuss in the planning process. Um, we've, in the guide, we talk about adjusting on-street motor vehicle parking to better accomplish complete streets goals. Um, and again, it's it's this idea that um, it's it's not all or nothing, and there's a lot of really important stuff we can do um, within a larger project. So we can swap parallel parking with the bike lane to provide a separated bike lane. Um, we can create space for bike and micro mobility parking. Um, we can organize street elements in that space created by parking, um, and also uh, create things like parklets and outside seating. Um, we can also provide better accessible parking and more accessible parking, better bus stop accommodations and, and uh, better commercial loading and also shared mobility pickup and drop off, which we know is becoming increasingly important in curbside management strategies for, for communities. Um, importantly, on the safety side, there's also things we can do about parking to improve safety. Um, things like taking a really serious close look at where there are mid-block pedestrian crossings and how can we pull back the parking to make sure visibility and expectations are clear um, in those situations, increasing visibility of bicyclists in separated bike lanes, um, and also just generally improving intersection design through things like protected intersections. So coming back to the question, um, it looks like we've got uh, pretty similar uh, information in there as before. Um, Dan, can you let me know if you see that on your end? Yep, I see it. Okay. okay. Uh, we can come back to this as well. Um, I know we've we're uh, going to be pressed for time, so what I'm going to recommend is rather than stay here much longer, I'm going to uh, pass to Jared so he can walk through the intersection document, and then we'll get into a discussion. Uh, Jared, are you there? I'm here. Okay. If you want to go to the next slide. Oh, wow, look at that, oh. there it is. Actually, yeah, I was gonna say, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of great responses. 
Um, and uh, sorry, let me cut in, Jared, to just tell people um, before you feel the need to take a picture of your screen. I'll try to uh, get this for everyone, and maybe we can paste it into the uh, slide deck uh, on the archive. So we'll try to get you this information. I know everybody's super interested in zooming in on this. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll well, move here on we now. are. Yep. Here we are, right here. Actually, it, now it looks like I expected it to look. Can you see that, Dan? Yep. Sure can. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jared, would you like to say anything about kind of what you're seeing on the screen now? Yeah, I think that there's a there's a lot of really good information in here, um, and a lot of things that we know and we've heard in the bikeway selection um, workshops that were issues uh, when it came to that balance of bikeway networks and on street parking. Um, things like political will, decision making, specifically around space and loading zones. Um, you know what the real parking need or utilization is. All of those things are things we we heard over and over again. Um, it's good to see them reiterated here. Okay, great. And as Dan said, we're happy to to share this afterwards. Um, I am going to just make sure that our next mentee poll shows up correctly. And then Jared, uh, I am going to share my screen. Here's Perfect. just a, just a reminder for Mentimeter. Um, it's M-E-N-T-I dot com with this code. Um, and I believe the new question should be showing up for you now, which is here. And Jared, I'll pass to you. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Um, as, as Dan mentioned, if that code is at the top, it's uh, 39, 97, 94, 32. Um, and this is the next question. We're going to leave this one up uh, as we walk through this next resource. But uh, in your community, what makes intersections one of the major barriers to a fully connected bike network? We know that there are a lot of barriers, um, but again, we wanted to we want to focus in on intersections. Um, and so we will leave this up throughout. Again, it's 39, 97, 94, 32, and we'll come back to this um, at the end before we dive into a few other questions. You'll go to the next slide for me. Um, all right. Well. Uh, as Dan and Lauren mentioned, one of the things that we talked a lot about during workshops and question and answer um, was specifically around bikeway selection at intersections. Um, there were uh, several communities that voiced the fact that um, maybe they did have a little bit of extra right of way or some some additional pavement width during at the mid block and through the segments that the appropriate bikeway type um, could work. However, as they approached the intersection, the need for a variety of things, um, whether it was turn lanes, multiple turn lanes, um, loading zones, uh, parking or dropping parking, transit, all of those things kind of came into play. And oftentimes that became a very difficult place to continue um, whatever the preferred or the desirable bikeway type was through that intersection. And so we developed this uh, resource in a response. And again, I think it's a it's great to mention that this is a resource and um, for for kind of thinking through the process um, to inform decisions. And really, we know that a lot of decisions made about design and operation of street intersections have historically, been, played a central role in bikeway selection, but it's been focused on vehicles um, and kind of favoring motor vehicle traffic. And so uh, what we wanted to do was really unpack some of the analysis um, and think through kind of the spatial considerations for a variety of bikeway types at intersections. You can go to the next slide for me. And as Dan mentioned, we, we want to give you an overview. This resource is, um, I would say, very digestible. It's uh, you know under 20 pages and gives you a lot of information. Um, it does start with the idea of performance metrics. The, we know that when we are designing bikeways, specifically in the retrofit scenario at intersections, there's a variety of considerations. Um, that all fall into the in intersections functional area, which is what you can see highlighted in blue on the screen. Um, just to name a few, there's uh, property lines, existing curbs, um, drainage, driveways, utilities, transit, and you can probably think of a lot of others. And so 
with that in mind, um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is kind of brought to the forefront is that when we're developing um, performance metrics at intersections and thinking about bikeway selection, we can't only focus on vehicular delay and or volume capacity ratios for, for vehicles. Um, I think it's really important and there's a lot of great resources in um, this supplemental guide um, on intersections and bikeway selection about what things like the highway capacity manual says. Um, we know that if we're going to be create a kind of a holistic approach to bikeway selection and we're going to implement and um, really construct bikeways in our communities that achieve the goals that we have locally and that are context sensitive, that we, we can't primarily depend upon maybe a measure such as um, motor vehicle level of service. Um, we need to be a little bit, we need to think bigger. And so a few things that are mentioned in the guide are first safety, um, really as a, as a priority. Um, what are we doing? What, you know, what is happening at that specific intersection as well as what's happening along our entire system? Um, Dan mentioned around uh, considering ADA and I think it has to be at the forefront of our conversations. Is there a way to um, not only uh, add in bikeways, but make the experience better for all ages and abilities that are moving um, at those intersections? Uh, there are other things that to be considered, pedestrian and bike quality of service metrics. Uh, some of those could be level of traffic stress, bicycle level of service, pedestrian level of service, multimodal level of service. Um, I think it's really important, no matter what uh, metric that you're using, that you understand the strengths as well as the limitations um, that are involved in each one. The next thing to consider is traffic analysis. And I know that in many of our communities, this may be something that drives some of the decision making or the intersection design. Um, it may be the reason that the bike lane ends um, before the intersection and doesn't kind of continue through. However, uh, it is very clear that this needs to be, it, it can't be the sole metric. Um, really some of the traffic analysis and, and the assumptions that are made that we'll get into here shortly um, can be used to fine tune what our design is going to be, um, but it, it should not be the defining element. Um, and then also to think about travel time. Um, I know that in several uh, communities that I work, uh, we talk about delay and travel time, but it's really focused on a specific intersection and what kind of delay exists in that at that one intersection, rather than thinking about the entire corridor um, and really how maybe that is one kind of a, a, a bottleneck of the intersection or of the corridor, but it is only one piece of the entire trip. Um, the other value of thinking about travel time is that it can start to frame the conversation to include the trip time and the delay for both bicyclists and pedestrians. And so these are just a few of the performance metrics that are mentioned, but we definitely encourage um, to think about your local context um, and then to really make sure that you're considering every everyone um, in those performance metrics, not just uh, motor vehicle delay or capacity. Do you go to the next slide for me? Sorry, Dan. There we go. Um, the next thing, and, and as Dan mentioned, these are not design standards. However, what we wanted to do is make sure that it was very clear for, for any practitioner to be able to see how a variety of different bikeways and bikeway type bikeway intersections um, change the spatial kind of the spatial needs. Um, and so you can see here there are five different um, bikeway intersection types that have been identified. There are there's the protected intersection, the kind of your traditional or conventional bike lane, uh, a pocket hole or keyhole bike lane, um, which really divides the uh, designated right and a through lane or kind of splits between them, a mixing zone, and then a shared lane. Um, the, the colors that you're seeing, kind of the darkest or the darkest area is the conflict area or the area that really represents exposure. And then um, notes specific places where conflict markings may be, may be um, included. And so you can see the level of exposure and the level of the, the spatial needs um, on kind of the, the conflict area, uh, it really does change 
um, intersection type by intersection type. And so um, we wanted to follow this kind of graphic up with a few dimensions. And if you'll go to the next slide for me. Um, and I'll actually, sorry about that. It's the, the one after this. Um, we, we wanted to focus on giving you some of those key dimensions of what is the bikeway width and along with what is the street buffer width. Um, that is really important for each one of these intersections. And we, we kind of gave some ranges um, knowing that, again, your community and the context that you're working within, um, potentially the constrained right of way could be very different. Um, but it does, it's really important for us to know and have those numbers available when we're thinking about that entire functional area. Um, thanks for that, Dan. If you'll go back one slide for me. Thanks. Um, another piece that we wanted to, that this resource outlines are the uh, safety and equity focused design principles. Um, there, are se there are several of these and some really good information around each one. Um, one of the things that we, we brought forward from the, the larger bikeway selection guide are the sustainable safety principles that were noted. And so you can see here around bikeway continuity, um, the idea that equitable transportation systems are going to ensure that um, both safety and mobility needs are met for all modes and giving equal consideration, not only at and approaching an intersection, but also through the intersection. Um, we know that it's important to minimize exposure to conflicts, and that's why we illustrated those by bikeway intersection type. Um, reducing speed at conflict points. This is not only the turning movement, which we know is really important, but also, it, depending on your bikeway type, the weaving movement. And so how do we reduce those speeds, um, even if there is exposure, trying to make sure that they, um, any kind of conflict has a lower speed? Um, for turning and weaving. Also clearly communicating right of way. This is uh, can come down to some simple countermeasures of actually marking uh, conflict areas of creating crosswalks and um, bike crossings, um, making sure that priority is really established and um, making those streets and bikeways at intersections very legible for all users. And then lastly, to provide adequate sight distance. Um, this is gonna be key to safety, um, but also to make sure that all of our users understand where um, each, each of us are coming from um, and how they're moving into kind of the next space across intersections or making any turning movements. You can go to the next slide. Sorry, one more back. Um, along with the spatial considerations, we wanted to, we looked at a variety of um, pieces that were also included in the, the bikeway selection guide. Uh, thinking about functionality and perceived comfort, uh, we wanted to uh, show how each intersection type really kind of stacked up against or compared to one another when it came to all of these factors. And so uh, thinking about approach exposure as well as the, the actual exposure in those conflict areas. You can go to the next slide. Um, going on from there, uh, each of those intersection types, we looked at the ability to, to limit or constrain the conflict area and con exposure, as well as how to kind of clear, how each one of these intersection types clarified the right of way priority. And as you, if you can remember back to the slide where it showed each of those in plan view, you would see that some of them you're able to kind of really constrain and identify where um, that, that priority is. Others, it's a little bit harder and it's a little bit blurry. And so um, that was really important. Next is the reliance or the awareness um, on behavior to avoid crashes. So not only from motor vehicles, but also bicyclists. If there's separation, and then finally, the amount of scanning that is needed to really identify and locate other, um, other modes. And so each one of those intersection types um, does that a little bit differently. Go to the next slide. I'll wrap this up with, we went through a number of traffic analysis assumption and tips, and I think this is one of the greatest values in this resource, is that it really does walk through a number of fairly standard um, traffic analyses that in, in highlights some of the, the key kind of the benefits, but also things that maybe should be questioned when it comes to assumptions. Um, going back to the fact that the bikeway selection guide is not a standard, but rather a way for us to critically think 
um, and ask questions and really thoughtfully implement bikeways in our communities that are context sensitive. And so I'll walk through a few of these. You can see um, there's a list, several here. But first is volume projections. Um, we know that in many of our communities, when we're thinking about uh, changing intersections in our transportation system, we're projecting out uh, motor vehicle volumes. And oftentimes we use a conservative approach. And while a conservative approach is really valuable and important um, in several arenas, including bridge design and structural engineering, um, it can lead so, to some out, um, outcomes that maybe are less desirable um, for our, our roadways and maybe even overbuilt streets um, in the short term and really waiting on those projections to, to be realized um, so it could Im impact some of our safety performance. If you go to the next slide. Future year, very similar. We often use five to 30 years and kind of looking toward a future condition. Um, this really does presume that existing travel behavior could remain the same. Um, there's another one about growth rates, growth rates and thinking about that percentage year after year of growth. And so oftentimes um, this could lead to very similar effects where we have overbuilt streets in the, in the short term. So we could be reducing safety performance. Um, we could also have increased maintenance for overbuilt structures, or we could end up with self-fulfilling prophecies where we actually do build a wider street and we just have more and more um, motor vehicle volume. And so something for us to consider is just um, what are we doing? I think if anything, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, the past year um, and changing travel patterns, changing work patterns, increasing in bicycling, all of those things are for, things for us to consider about what, what's uh, in store for the future. If you go to the next slide. Level of service, um, this is obviously one in many communities is going to be um, something that is really focused upon when it comes to delay and congestion. Um, I think that a key piece of this and one of the, the areas that I really like about this resource is that many of these analyses after a description provide some analysis tips um, or even some key takeaways. And then later in the document, some kind of discussion prompts to um, for you and other practitioners that are thinking through bikeway selection and intersections uh, to really think about what is going into your analysis. But for level of service, really evaluating what do we mean by acceptable? What is that threshold? Um, I will say that we, we note a few things in this document around uh, what the highway capacity manual um, notes, specifically that uh, neither level of service nor any other single performance measure can tell the full story of the of roadway performance. It's also stated that the existence of a level of service F condition does not by itself indicate that any action must be taken to correct a condition. And so um, really important for us to be thinking about what is going into that analysis? Does it reflect our community's goals? Are there, are there thresholds that we need to, to tweak and evaluate over time? If you go to the, the next slide, I believe I'm almost done here, is a time period and analysis period. We know that oftentimes we're talking about peak period and that's what we're trying to, we're focused on that, that 15 minutes. Um, depending on how your analysis is structured, you may be looking about the, at the peak on top of the peak. And so really recognizing that um, people are using our streets at all hours of the day and night. And so how do we, how do we really take that peak period into consideration, but are there other things that we can be doing? And so uh, a few other analysis assumptions um, and, I, and tips are around network utilization and peak spreading, as well as thinking through uh, signal timing and assumptions. All right, you'll go to the next slide. Um, lastly, there are some other resources. Um, I mentioned that uh, we, we noted uh, several of the FHWA resources along with the uh, um, MassDOT separated bike lane design guide, as well as the recent um, NACTOs don't give up on the, at the intersection. Um, all of those are fantastic resources to be, to be using and to be looking to uh, for your individual communities and to think about bikeway selection at intersections specifically and how they can really, um, how, how bikeways can move through those intersections to overcome some of the barriers or the challenges that may have faced us in the past. And with that, I think that we have 
All right. Okay, Maybe great, we'll get... I'm gonna. Uh... Here we go. Do you see that now? I do. Yes, and I think that this is again another. It's really um, kind of re reassuring and um, and kind of affirming a lot of what we what we heard in workshops around why intersections are those major barriers. Um, turn lanes or the need for turn lanes, and I, I, maybe there's a, a quotation around the need, um, really unclear expectations, uh, thinking about funding of what, how, how does that change the, the functional area and what does it cost? Um, yeah, a lot of these are around some of, you know, I can see a lot of the analysis that we just talked about um, implement, really influencing some of the reasons why uh, bike bikeways might not be moving through intersections along bikeway networks. That's great. Okay, thank you, Jared. Um, I'm going to move us along and and uh, bring Lauren back into the conversation. Um, while I set up the next slide, can you see that now, Dan? We sure can. can see it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. Well, Lauren, I'm going to pass to you to facilitate um, a Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, we hope you we hope you uh, took something from the overview of the two resources, and so now we're really excited to dig in into a, a informal dialogue about about what we've discussed and and what um, you all are seeing in your community. So, Lauren. Very good. Thanks, Dan, and thank you, Jared. Um, so, there's a, a lot of questions in the uh, chat and the Q and A box, um, and you know, and several of the questions are about design or about design features. Uh, you know, a lot of those answers are more found in the design resources, and of course, several people have been asking about specific design resources like the Ashto Bike Guide and its timeline. I think our uh, we've we've been maybe answering some of those questions as they've come in, but I think really the best go-to folks for that are gonna be the ASHTO organization themselves. Um, but we're all hopeful that sometime soon we'll get to see the uh, revised edition of the bikeway or the bike design guide. Uh, that said, beyond some of those more specific or technical design questions, um, I think one kind of overarching topic that folks are asking about goes back to some of those those uh, considerations that you mentioned early on, I think especially during Dan, your, your presentation, but also Jared during yours. So some of the questions are about really understanding how to analyze some of the, the um, outcomes or the impacts to both bicyclist and uh, other roadway users. So folks have been asking questions about levels of service. Um, you mentioned some of the um, options of using that and how it's not a, there's not a silver bullet. But I think another question that's come up, and maybe this is more for Jared, is that uh, levels of traffic stress. So Jared, can you talk a little bit more about uh, maybe some of the application of level of traffic stress, what the bikeway selection guide says about that, and any other comments you may have about using um, levels of service, or if you've seen good examples of using levels of service to assess um, bikeways, especially at intersections. Yeah, I can, I can definitely uh, start off with that one. So I think that, um, you know, as, as mentioned here, with when we're thinking about performance metrics, having some kind of metric around on bicycle and pedestrian quality of service is important. Um, it is still only one of several that may be used. Level of traffic stress is going to be a great resource for um, really being able to do a comparison across all bikeway types, or I guess in the lack of bikeways to understand kind of that condition or the perceived comfort um, or stress that is on a bicyclist on our streets. And so that's going to be a really great resource if you're thinking about how to connect different parts of your bikeway network. And maybe it is the fact that you have, um, that you have, you know, kind of gaps uh, across intersections or major corridors that's going to be able to highlight those for you. Um, for the bicycle level of service and pedestrian level of service, really it's going to combine 
um, the idea of user comfort, capacity, and street characteristics um, and give you kind of an overall score. And so that it, the, the difficulty there is that it's not really taking in the stress that's, that's directly put on um, a bicyclist at an intersection because if the capacity is there, the overall width um, exists, then it may come out with a higher score. And so um, I think the, the difficulty that we're finding with communities um, is that, again, not having a silver bullet, not using one of those analysis to tell the entire story, but to understand what those street characteristics are at their intersections that may be deterring bicyclists from using the intersection or continuing on the bikeway network um, is gonna be really important. And those are all data pieces, data points that can be inserted into our analysis. Jared, Jared, this is Dan, if I could just jump in. Um, it's, I think it's funny you use the term no silver bullet because that's exactly what I wrote down just before you said it, um, which, which is that, you know, the design is evolving. Um, it is problematic that it takes so long to get new design resources out in, in kind of this current environment where kind of the state of play is changing at a pretty rapid clip. Um, so I think on the design side and, and kind of a lot of these things, I think the challenge is, is not that the resources don't exist uh, per se, but, but the, the challenge is more navigating between different resources, um, finding and acknowledging the design flexibility that exists. And we know Federal Highway um, is supportive of design flexibility um, and, and also uh, pushing to, to get things like the Astro Bike Guide out on the street because it is um, enormously important. Thanks, Dan. Um, Dan, let me follow up on another question with you. Uh, so there were uh, also some questions about the considerations for on-street parking and um, essentially the questions came around when you are looking at angle parking in particular and also trying to incorporate a formal bike lane or bikeway onto the roadway but you also have constrained environments. So you may have limited right of way. Uh, you know, essentially, I think some of the questions folks are asking is when you have some of those constraints and when do you start thinking about changing the bikeway type, maybe downgrading to a shared lane consideration uh, if you don't have the buffer space or, you know, how do you assess that against some of the parking trade-offs? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really kind of gets to the, the core of the challenge. Um, I, I guess with regards to downgrading facilities, I think one thing I'll point out is the, the process diagram that you showed on your slide, uh, Lauren, um, which which talks about that downgrade situation. And, and you'll notice um, that there's, there's an arrow pointing back up to community goals uh, <laughs> when you downgrade the facility, because I think it's important that we acknowledge that when that happens, um, that's going to have impact. And if your if your goal, if your community goal developed in your planning process was to meet the needs of all users, um, you need to have a serious conversation at the local level, kind of that 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 didn't happen, and that we need to go back and reassess how important that is to us, because it's a it's a policy level decision and a and a values based decision. Um, with that said, I would say that, you know, parallel routes, you know, every street can't do everything for everyone. Um, so I think, I think it is, there always is going to be a need to balance the primary kind of user types and functionality kind of of the different streets in the network. And so, um, as I mentioned before in the network conversation, I mean, I think we need we need to be thinking quickly on our feet about parallel routes in that situation. Um, if we can't get a bike facility in, what does that mean for the broader network? Um, if there's a parallel route that's comfortable and that works for everyone, um, that might be your, your solution. Um, so I would say, um, even if that's the case and you go for the parallel route, I think we need to acknowledge that not everyone's going to take it. People are going to take the thing that is most comfortable and convenient um, and most time efficient for them often, usually. Um, so I think we, we need to recognize that, look for the parallel route, but then, you know, recognize that, that 
you know, systemic safety improvements are, are still probably going to be needed, even if you didn't get in the desired bike facility. Um, as far as measuring the decisions, I think, you know, I think the countermeasures, just, just generally proven safety countermeasures and all the important work in the step process provides a lot of information on that. Um, FHWA has a guide for the development of pedestrian and bicycle performance measures. I think that's also an important resource. Um, and I'll say on page 11 of the parking resource, there's also a set of kind of data-driven decisions. And so I think in, embedded in that gets to some of the answer, which is that we, we need to understand what's really going on in that situation and, and be making conscious choices. And and I might I might add, I just think that one of the issues that we often find is that it feels all or nothing, that you know, it's either bikeway or parking. But I think that one of the the pieces that the parking resource points out is that you can make strategic changes to not only um, still provide parking, but also to increase comfort and safety for those with, you know, with a bikeway. And so um, I would encourage people to, to be creative, um, to problem solve and to, to not just say, we have to have parking so we can't have a bikeway or vice versa. Good, thanks. So uh, kind of going from that, uh, Jared, you just said problem solve, being creative. So uh, you guys probably won't be surprised to know that there's a lot of questions about Problem solving at the intersection when you have um, specific um, turning movements that either the bicyclist is trying to make or you may have heavy right turns, but you've also got separated bike lanes. So, you know, without this necessarily becoming a question about how to design that type of intersection, how do you think about uh, incorporating the separated bike lane when you have some of those those turning movement considerations. And I think, Jared, you might have covered this to some extent in the graphic you showed earlier with the different, uh, the visualization showing the different alignments for how bike lanes align with different turn lanes, you know, sometimes mixing zones, sometimes you have the the keyhole. So can you talk about that a little bit more, um, especially about how separated bike lanes and those turning movements need to be considered? Yeah, I think that, and Dan, I don't know if you want to go back to that graphic or not, but I think that one of the things that is really valuable to think about is that, um, so here you can see on the far left is the protected intersection. So having a separated directional or two-way separated bike lane, even a shared use path, could use some of these elements. Um, now, I think that there's a lot of things that go into play. So you can see that corner refuge island that's going to slow down the turning speed. We don't have to worry about in a protected intersection, um, the kind of the weaving movement because we've, we've actually created the separation even on the approach. Um, so it really does minimize the exposure. Um, now you can do a lot of things. You could be thinking about um, you know, bike signals, you could restrict right on red, uh, you could have, you know, a leading interval. Um, the, the nice thing about protected intersections is that we're trying to increase some of the, those, the sight distance and the visibility of people that are on bikes, um, giving them a head start of where they're already starting to cross the intersection before that turning vehicle, um, and making sure that there's really good awareness. Um, I will say that I know that um, having separated bike lanes everywhere is not an option for a lot of communities because of um, right-of-way constraints. However, it, there are a lot of great options in being creative, again, problem solving and critically thinking about how you could transition to protected intersection elements and both the NACTO resource as well as um, FHWA's guidance on separated bike lanes and flexibility and design um, as well as the MassDOT separated bike lane, have some great information around specific elements at intersections that can reduce that turning speed, increase visibility, um, and really start to you know, protect bicyclists as they're crossing the intersection, um, as well as making turning movements themselves. Yeah, and, and Jared, if I could just reiterate the importance of slowing down the speed. Um, I think kind of what what we're trying to accomplish is to make the conflict less likely. 
um, and if and when it does happen to, to make it less likely that it will be serious or fatal. And so I think slowing down that speed is a really a critical part of, of the story that we have to get serious about um, in the US. Um, I think the clear expectations, you're exactly right on that, and also visibility to me is, is, is so important in all of these conversations. And that is that is also even though we're not talking about standards of design, those are policy decisions that will influence the way that you create your your standards um, for designing intersections um, within your communities. Thanks, guys. Um, and just one follow up question about that. I know a lot of the illustrations in the resource are about. Um, some of the, the geometric improvements, but can you talk just briefly about some of the options for using signalization or different signal phases at those protected intersections? I think a few people are trying to understand some of the options of, you know, maybe, or even the trade-offs between an um, exclusive uh, all movement bike phase versus, you know, different options. So, it, you know, without getting into a conversation about signal phasing, do you have any general thoughts about that? Yeah, I'll keep it brief just because I think that, you know, as the MUTCD is being updated and we're kind of thinking about a lot of changes, I, I do think there's some really good um, thoughts around, you know, green intervals, uh, thinking about bike signals, um, really, again, main thinking about priority and legibility at these intersections. I think that that's really, I, I don't want to overcomplicate it, even though there's a lot of detail um, and can, complexity around intersections is that we need to know um, everyone on our roadways at intersections needs to understand where other movements are happening and that who is being prioritized and there is a hierarchy that needs to be established with our more vulnerable users um, and so starting with pedestrians and those you know that are in mobility devices uh, using mobility devices and then bicyclists we, we need to prioritize their movements. We need to establish clear paths for them and make it legible. And then as we get into signal timing, we need to make sure that we're not creating scenarios that they are not visible um, and that they don't, they aren't, you know, having a safe and comfortable crossing. And so um, I don't want to get into it too much, but I think that there's a lot of kind of uh, efforts that we have been made and are examples across the country of what's being done for, for signal phasing. Mm -hmm. and I, yeah, and and just to add on that, I think, I, I think Jared, Jared, you're right that that we, it is very complicated. But I think there's a danger of overcomplicating it sometimes because I think it's, it's really important to be crystal clear about what we're trying to accomplish, um, what are the assumptions embedded into the to the dialogue, which is kind of what a lot of the intersection resource gets into. What are those assumptions? Um, and how are we balancing a concern about delay with concerns about other things and, and what's acceptable um, to us with regards to delay if it means we can accomplish other community goals. Good, thanks. So uh, that's a great segue, I think, to another uh, kind of grouping of questions that have been coming in. You talked about community goals and values um, and then, you know, certainly those can show up as policy statements, but uh, earlier, I think it may have been during your presentation, Dan, when you talked about equity. Can you guys talk uh, just a bit more about uh, how the bikeway selection process in particular and some of these resources should um, include and also consider the needs of uh, some of those most vulnerable populations and, and people that have maybe more impacted by bikeway decisions. I think folks are asking questions about, you know, how do you, how do you think about it in a, um, on a project by project basis? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would say it, we have to do it on a project by project basis and we also have to do it from a systemic perspective. And so, um, getting back to kind of something that I had talked a little bit about before is kind of when we're thinking about equity and who's impacted and and what what are the decisions that come out of a planning process. Um, I think we need to redouble our efforts 
to really think critically about every step along the way. Um, and so, you know, in a planning process that can go all the way back to, you know, what were the visions and what was the vision and the goals that we were trying to accomplish when we did this corridor project? And when we were analyzing existing conditions, kind of what what were we focused on and, and who were we talking to and who were we not talking to? Um, and when we're prioritizing kind of what are what are the metrics either quantitatively or qualitatively that we're using to prioritize the alternatives? I think I think another thing kind of when we think about these decisions that come out of a of street design process, um, it's really important that we're also evaluating kind of the process and the outcomes um, and, and documenting that. Um, you know, if if this process was intended to improve access for people with disabilities, did, did we talk to people with disabilities? <laughs> I think that's something that is often missed in a planning process and there's a lot of assumptions made um, you know we're working on a project right now um, where we're actually going kind of up and down a corridor with people with visual disabilities and we're talking to them about kind of how they're experiencing floating bus stops and separated bike lanes and intersections um, and i'll say that process is incredibly insightful it's not you know we're learning a lot as we as we experience the built environment with them um, and I think that's a really important part of a planning of a good planning process. And I will be brief, but I, I really like to hear that it's a project by project and that's what people are thinking about. Because just because you've identified a certain bikeway on a map doesn't mean that that bikeway looks and feels the same for people experiencing it in different parts of your community. And so we need to we need to think about um, and we need to engage and hear voices of how that infrastructure um, can be can be context sensitive um, and provide the the greatest benefit um, for for those local users. We we know how to do we we understand safety, um, but sometimes we without engaging the community we don't get we don't get the context of how how the implementation um, should really should be uh, carried out. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And I think often we also sometimes we look at one snippet of data and we we assume that we understand what's going on and actually it's a lot more nuanced than the data would, would appear. <laughs> so I think it's always important to keep that in mind also that we, we may know how much parking exists and we may have a general sense for what the utilization is and, and who the users are of that parking, um, but we really need to test those assumptions and, and actually do surveys of local business customers to understand like the business owner thinks that 90% of their customers are driving and parking in an on-street spot, but actually it's that's not what's happening. Um, and so I think it's really important to be digging deep into the data and not assuming that we know what's happening kind of if <laughs> when we may, we may be missing really important parts of the story. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I got one more kind of grouping of questions that are uh, kind of floating out there. So some of this also has to do with that design user you just mentioned, Dan. Um, you know, a couple people are asking questions about what do you do when you have observed poor compliance at intersections where you have bicyclists uh, either approaching or, uh, you know, maybe not using the intersection or this the, uh, the way that it's intended. And then I think maybe coupled with that, there's some questions about any best practices for educating drivers and other roadway users. So, uh, you know, do you guys have any thoughts about how to best uh, approach um, that compliance and education concern? Any good examples out there that you know about? Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in there. I think on the poor compliance thing, I, I think it's something we have to deal with, but we also have to recognize that human behavior is human behavior. And so I think our, the goal should be um, to shoot for the best behavior possible, but re kind of reduce the consequences of bad behavior as much as possible <laughs> at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, and I'd say that that's something that they they do very well in the Netherlands as an example, where it's very intuitive 
they're not telling you what to do as quite as much it doesn't feel like um, and they're not they may not be enforcing quite as much but the environment is built in such a way that um, the consequences are, are much less drastic and it, it actually works really well um, and so I think there's a lot of cases where where we we could learn from that in in the US I think educating uh, folks and educating drivers is, is is incredibly important. Educating pedestrians and bicyclists is incredibly important, um, especially in things like bicyclist behavior in a separated bike lane around a floating bus stop where, you know, I think that that is a critical thing and it's a relatively new design. And so there's a lot more new need for um, outreach and, and education on on infrastructure types that are that are relatively new to most of us. So. Yeah, I'll just say I think that I think that we we have the tools to design intersections and bikeways and streets and our transportation networks and systems uh, in a way that really um, encourages compliance. And I think that we can do that strategically and thoughtfully. So um, all of that is really important. And as for education, uh, it it does take some work up front, but things after that you know time passes i was really glad to hear this week that um, about some communities in arizona doing rear end angle parking for over 15 years that it's it's not even an issue anymore even though that is very new to some communities and it seems like a, a kind of a steep learning curve um, but it does get better and change is hard but we we understand that um, it's necessary in so many ways um, Lauren, uh, Dan, Jared, uh, let me jump in here and, and just uh, finish off with a, tie a few more questions together before we have to head out. And I put up on the slide here, and this is in your deck that we shared, um, contact info for our panel uh, to follow up. If you have questions, you want to dive into some more topics. A lot of you know really uh, nuanced and, and unique and specific questions related to design, as Lauren mentioned. And um, there are some resources we'd be glad to share if you just reach out. Um, the, I'm going to try to tie together a few, several questions that are all related to uh, what this past year has taught us, really. You know, we're coming up on, well, we're just past a year recognizing a, a totally different period in our lives, and, and it's impacted us in many ways. But, but I think we can, it seems like we can learn a lot from this period in terms of how agencies have responded to COVID demands on active travel um, and and perhaps, you know, doing some things that they wouldn't have otherwise done. I, I'm curious to know, maybe, Jared, I don't know if you want to start uh, to see what we can learn from this um, pandemic response period and how we might be able to come out of it with with lessons for how we proceed with bikeway selection. Have we have we learned anything interesting um, within the context of maybe some of the topics we're already talking about here? Yeah, that's great. I'll start and I'll let Dan finish this up. I think that um, the ideas that we've mentioned today and things that FHWA and, and others have been, ASHTO has been pushing around flexibility uh, are, are so true now. And it's been experimented with um, in communities across the country this last year. I would also say that because things have changed, whether it's travel patterns and traffic volumes and working patterns, the fact that no one can buy a bicycle anywhere, um, that th there's really no better time for us to reconsider how we evaluate some of our decisions um, along our, our transportation networks. How are we doing? How are we doing analysis? What assumptions are we making? Are they the right assumptions or they do they need to be modified with um, our new goals um, locally? So I don't know if you have any other things to add to that, Dan. Yeah, I'll just, just say quickly that I think, I think one of the lessons learned um, in the in the pandemic is is out of necessity a lot of processes were kind of process barriers were broken um, and I think it's really important right now to to investigate that um, where where did it happen where did it lead to good outcomes um, and and where do we need to go back and and um, build a real inclusive equitable planning process around these things as we think about what what uh, remains as a permanent change versus going back to what it was before. Um, I think there's a lot of lessons to learn on the process barriers that were broken, but I think we also have to be really, really careful to make sure that that we're doing a real planning process as we're thinking about what becomes permanent. Well, that's a great place to leave it. I, I think um, I've learned a lot today. I hope the the tools that we've talked about, you know, we 
we're able to hit them uh, and talk to them a little bit during the session, but they're really there waiting for you to, to apply and consider in your own communities and in your work. So I hope you'll be able to get some use out of them. Come back to us, let us know what questions you have. Um, uh, please reach out if you do have any additional uh, questions. I wanna thank everyone here for participating in the webinar today. I'd like to let you know that as you leave, you'll be greeted with a, just a sh short uh, list of questions to provide some feedback and maybe some ideas about webinar topics we could cover in the future. We'd be very interested in those and, and all that feedback you have for us. Um, I wanna issue a special thanks to uh, Tamara Redman, her office, uh, for, uh, for delivering such great resources like this one and participating today. And Lauren Blackburn, Dan Goodman, and Jared Draper for all your uh, great work um, pulling together these resources and sharing your expertise, your presentations today. Uh, we really have appreciated it and enjoyed it. Um, I hope uh, you all have a wonderful rest of the day. We hope to see you on our uh, next webinar. Thanks very much, everyone.